become a bit more lighter, but so I can see, 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 see my notes. <laughs> That's it, that's enough, that's fine. That's absolutely fine, yeah, that's perfect, thanks. <laughs> it's just it's just to get bullet points with really. you. Right, well, thanks very much for knowing. It's all right, you can put it in. Yeah, down as the previous, that's it. Um, well, thanks very much to all of you for coming out tonight, and uh, hopefully you'll find this quite an interesting presentation, something a little bit different. Um, I'm Peter, G8GYS, uh, it's Nigel, G8AYC. Um, I've been interested in producing my own TV pictures. Um, it says here, since 1969-70, which is a hell of a long time ago. Um, and my first video source was a, was a 405 line flying spot scanner built around an old television in a 931A photo, photo multiplier tube. That's going back a long, long way. I then um, built a, a Vidicon camera, black and white Vidicon camera. And uh, somebody else was building one at the same time and they, and gave up on it, so I, I got their bits off them and made a second one. So I ended up with two black and white cameras, basically. And um, I hadn't thought particularly of transmitting. In, in fact, I was a shortwave listener at that time, both for broadcast and for amateur bands. Um, but I, never, I didn't actually know at that time that it was possible to put the two interests together and actually um, do amateur television. And it was meeting him that really, that really made the difference. I joined Link in, in at Link Electronics, which you might remember used to be on the Warworth Industrial Estate in 1972. And uh, shortly after I joined, Nigel joined. And um, we were chatting and it turned out that Nigel was an active TV amateur back where he came from previously in Gillingham in Kent. And um, he persuaded me to get licensed and also as I'd already got a lot of the gear to get onto amateur television as well. So that's really, we, that was frighteningly long yeah. time ago. That's 50 years ago this year, which is, which is a frighteningly long time. <laughs> anyway, so um, basically um, uh, the next thing that happened was that there were other people um, who were interested in amateur television at Link. In fact, some famous, uh, quite famous names, Dave Mann, G8ADM, who's, who's chairman of the BATC, um, John Tanner, G8AER, who sadly passed away recently, and Peter Blakeler, G3PYB, who passed away a few years ago, who was a leading light in microwaves and did a lot of work on, on amateur TV and microwaves from his home down near um, in Portsmouth. So um, they were all working for the same company. And so we had quite a nice little net going of amateur TV activity. It was a bit of a hot spot in Andover. And uh, that really um, was what got me very interested into it. Um, and um, what I'm going to show you shortly is around about the time that ARAC first started, um, I did a presentation to ARAC, very much like I'm doing now, on amateur television. And I've got some of the original contribution clips that, that were shown at the time, which I'm going to show you again now. And these, bear in mind, with this, these are quite old recordings. Some of them, in, most of them, in black and white. But it will give you a little bit of an idea of what amateur TV was like back in the late 70s and the early 80s, which is when they were recorded. So, if uh, welcome to the uh, yeah. amateur TV club for the amateur and Radio Amateur Club. This is off air. No, this is a, an evening of um, some significance because it must be all of two years since GAAER Stroke T has been on the air transmitting television properly. And the um, stimulus of this evening has actually prompted the station to turn on the big switch and risk the explosion of the electricity capacitors to get back on television. But fortunately it worked, and um, thanks to the cooperation and enthusiasm and encouragement of GHEYS, here we are. Centimeters. Be 
been transmitting uh, ATV for quite some time now, uh, starting originally in the, the London area quite a few years ago. The equipment here is fairly simple. It's a, a Vidicon camera down that end of uh, a conventional variety, I think we could say. And I use a small IF modulator, a little bit above uh, 30 megs, and transfer my TV signal up to 70 centimeters through uh, a homemade, but again, fairly conventional transfer to arrangement. One two linear amplifiers, and it pours out the other end at around about 100 watts, hopefully. Well, uh, this is Peter, yes, the I GYS. Like and uh, this is, in fact, the other end of the uh, transmission you've just seen, which was received off 70 centimetres. Right, well, we're back in the early 1980s. This was my electronic call sign generator, which I still have. And I now have a computerised version of it that I use on the satellite. Also at the time, I had a, an electronic um, test card generator. And again, I still have this. Here's a um, directional coupler connected to the output of my transmitter. That's the test card signal you just saw. And you can see me adjusting the bias on the output valve, which was a QQ V0640A. So uh, there were solid state parts to it, but the um, signal parts were all valve. Generated about 40 watts. And there's the equipment rack which again I still have, and um, at the top is the transmitter. That's replaced now with the QO100 transmitter. That's the pre-driver, which is a QQVO320A. And if you look to the right of that, you can see a black box, and that houses the actual final, the PA. Here are my old aerials, which you might remember, those of you who are old enough, at the bottom of Vigo Road. And you can see there a 23 centimetre experimental corner reflector that I tried for a while. Where that shot, of course, is all built over now. Now to receive again. Recognise that call sign, that's Nigel, GDAYC, received at my old QTH. It was a bit noisy because we didn't have a brilliant path, but better than we've got now. And uh, this here is a um, reception of him from uh, another side, actually from a stroke P location and recorded onto a um, VHS recorder that ran off 12 volts. You see his electronic call sign generator and various other electronic effects built in there, all very clever stuff. Especially as this is the, the 80s we're talking about here. Now we're looking out of his back window. And I think his view is not that dissimilar now. I think actually this was his old house, I can't remember. But um, anyway, um, there you are, there's uh, his seat which he's about to appear in. There we are, genuine amateur TV off-air signal from the 1980s. And he's now showing his various equipment. There's his computer, which is the rack unit on the uh, desk. You see his colour monitor at the bottom left and various other gear there. So, um, quite an interesting um, historical uh, recording this. And his wars caption, which I remember well, seeing on the air. Well, um, time that's a bit of history there. Time went by, link closed, and the ATV contacts moved away, apart from Nigel, who was at Newbury, as you saw, and workable for my old QTH in Andover. However, I got married and ended up living in Thruxton, which has the worst path imaginable to uh, Nigel at Newbury. We, we have worked on 2 metres and 6 metres using 100 watts of SSB, but <laughs> TV is not really too, too feasible, unfortunately. Um, there are ATV repeaters, but none in range at the moment. Hopefully, there's, that's going to change, but we, we don't know yet. However, thanks to some amazing recent technical advances, 
We can now exchange amateur TV pictures again, and with a large part of the world too. Here's Nigel now to tell you more about these exciting developments. Right. Just before that, I'm going to wind the rock back even further. This is my station in 1970, when I was operating a spare bedroom at my parents in Gillingham and Kent. Um, just went over from 405 to 625. At one stage, I actually had the station dual standard with a big switch. We switched everything over between 405 and 625 lines. Um, that's a transfer there, a pair of 4X150s in it. I might better recognise that ARH egg there as well. So, right. um, and station I was in very regular contact with the GCWFC, who was uh, just across the Thames in, uh, in Essex. And uh, we spent uh, so many hours every, every night sort of talking and that, that uh, people used to use us as a, as a reference to sort of set up their receivers and that. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's 19, 1970. Um, now we're going to move forward now to about 2015. Um, Something in the way of the Thanks. Um, so, there was already broadcast digital TV, both satellite and terrestrial, and the amateurs um, developed a reduced bandwidth version of that, um, which could so it was based on the um, satellite, so the DVBS, um, and but it developed a low symbol rate, which could go right the way down to 35 kilo symbols, so end up about one mega symbols normally used. Um, very popular rate, about 333 kilo symbols per second, which you will easily fit into a half meg bandwidth. And uh, people have been using that for terrestrial, use it on semi centimeters, they can fit a couple of transmissions in there. Um, Another benefit is it uh, can cover a much larger path loss. <coughs> Typically, you're getting on the order of 20 dB, so it's a big improvement over, over analog. Now, moving forward again, uh, Qatar um, launched this second SHL satellite, SHL 2, um, which was providing um, digital TV services for their area, uh, but also the amateurs built a linear transponder, um, so it's, they didn't use the satellite resources, they actually had their own dedicated linear transponder and uh, aerials, um, and, this, and they named it QO100, it's the 100th amateur satellite, but it's the first geosynchronous one, all the, all the other amateur satellites being much older than, I mean it's a low earth orbit, so they're um, they're great, but they're only, you only get that typically 10 minutes of use before they've gone from one horizon to the other horizon. And that's the footprint of the satellite. You can see how much of the world it covers. Um, the south of um, America there, um, uh, India, um, I've copied pictures from India, Mauritius. Um, several stations in South Africa are on. Um, we received pictures from the uh, station in Antarctica. So, as you can see, quite amazing coverage. And uh, this is what the satellite provides. Um, so, on the downlink, you've got two, two basic sections. You've got a narrowband section uh, for narrowband signals. Uh, You've got 500 kilohertz worth of bandwidth there. And it's a linear transponder, so anything you transmit just gets um, transponded down. So um, it's, it's uh, transmitting from the satellite to, to Earth at, as you can see, um, at about 10 and a half gigs roughly. As well as the narrow band section, uh, the bit we're interested in is the wide band section. We've got a full 8 megahertz of uh, bandwidth available there. <coughs> And on the uplink, what we need to send up is um, signals at that 2.4 gigs. Um, so again, you've got sort of the, the half meg bandwidth that's the narrow band signals, and now the, uh, <coughs> the uplink, the 8 megahertz bandwidth for the uplink.
Now, how to receive this stuff? Um, first of all, very easy to receive um, narrowband. Have a uh, LMB, which use your standard um, broadcast LMB, what you'd use for FreeSat. Uh, they, most of them will cover the frequency required, and it, and it turns out that the downlink frequency turns up at about 740 odd megs. So if you've got an SDR, like um, RTL dongle or, or an RSP1A, um, then you can tune it to uh, 740 something megs. And it's running on a computer, so you, you tune in and get your receive SSB or CW, whatever. So, very simple setup for narrowband. Now, for television, we have this. Um, so, we've got the same LMB again, 740 odd megs. We have something called a, a mini tuner. Uh, we've got a couple of examples here running. And this was developed by um, F6FDZ, um, which used uh, the, board, uh, the board and the software um, that you can actually see running here. Um, so the mini tuner, you can either run some software called Minitune on your PC, so quite simple. The hard work's already been done by F670Z. Um, or, instead of a PC, you actually run it into a, a Raspberry Pi, and the BATC, the Amateur Television Club, have produced uh, a bit of software called the Ride, which runs on the Pi. Very simple to get going, because they provide a complete image on the SD card with the whole operating system and everything, so you just download that ISO image put in an SD card, and this runs, uh, and use HDMI monitor and infrared remote control. You can program it to any remote, remote control you have to have. You can just set it to work with that. So it's a, basically a set-top box for your QO100. Um, and we've got that running over here. This is, that, that's actually running here. We've just got a little Raspberry Pi and the uh, MIDI tune box there and the monitor. Right, so if you're running the mini, mini tune software I described with the mini tune, uh, this is what it looks like, and it looks it looks a bit complicated, but don't worry, most of it's just information. Uh, basically, you've got a load on the left-hand side, you've got lots of presets. You can set up the presets for common new frequencies. Um, it's used for terrestrial work as well. I mean, it's got a particular Oscar 100, the Cure 100 mode there but you can use it for all the uh, other bands as well. It's got a very wide coverage, you know, 70 centimetres, even down to 2 metres and 6 metres, um, and 2.4 gigs, etc. Um, and you've got various things telling you the state of play regarding whether it's, whether it's locking them or the rest of it. Uh, down the bottom here, you've got a signal strength indicator. So you've got a, a MERV, figure, MER figure. This is like a digital signal to noise ratio. So that's currently running at 12 dB. What it does is, for a particular signal rate, it, it knows what the minimum signal required is to get a resolvable picture. And the amount of, you've got over that threshold is given as a, as a D value. So, so in this particular example, you've got 7 dB in hand. Then uh, on the right hand side here, You've got facilities, you can take a photograph, a snapshot, or we can even record the stream, that should be called you know, moving video. Um, there's lots of other facilities here which you know, I won't go into at this stage. It's a very, very thoroughly complex piece of software. Right, now how do you transmit television? So it's a bit complicated, but we, we split it into hardware and software. So on the hardware side, we've got a standard PC, the local area network, and if your dish is a long way away, like mine is in Newbury, you need some way of uh, remotely transmitting. Um, so what I've got is an Ethernet cable, 
up to the LAN, into the LAN, and the Ethernet to a USB adapter. And we've got something produced by analog devices. It's the add-on Bluetooth, which is an educational device, but it's absolutely perfect for our needs. So the wide frequency coverage and F5OEO has produced some software which has got the all the mod modulator, etc., built in. So all you do is you, you set the thing up um, to um, connect to the Ethernet, and you, what you've got is a um, an HDMI server, so you can ac access the Pluto via an HDMI, you know, just normal web browser, and set up features and stuff. Um, the output Pluto is quite low, as you have a pre-amplifier and then a main power amplifier, and that feeds your dish. And I'll show you what the feed looks like on the dish in a minute. On the soft, there's the software. Um, we've got something called OBS Studio, which is a, a wonderful piece of free software. Uh, it's basically a TV studio in a box. And basically, you can take pictures from the camera, it could be your web, webcam, um, still image files, video files, slideshows, audio. In fact, this presentation, I'm actually using OBS Studio right now. I've got a slideshow just, just uh, fixed to it. Um, Implement in in it, and it's projecting um, the video to uh, the external HDMI source, feeding the uh, video projector there. So it has an additional uh, plugin, which is virtual camera output, which generates a uh, video stream, which then needs to be encoded. And there's um, a very complex piece of software called FFmpeg, which provides your encoding which is encoding and compressing the video because is we can't try, we can't transmit video at the look at full data rate it's just lot, lots and lots of mega, megabytes per second so that's no good so we this compresses it just like broadcast TV uses compression so um, but luckily another, yet another French man f1 jp <coughs> has provided a, a, a wrapper which is like a GUI down FFmpeg, and it insulates you from all the intricacies of FFmpeg. So, so you get a nice simple GUI where you just set up the, the symbol rate you want and the rest of it. And what it does is it generates a UDP, uh, which is a, one of the internet protocols, UDP stream um, through, the, through the LAN, through the local area network, to the, uh, to the Pluto. And then uh, down there is what I described. The web browser are actually talking to the Pluto. So uh, I'm very fortunate that the uh, analog devices uh, device came, uh, came along at about the right time. So everything sort of came together, so sort of made it all, all work. Uh, I talked about the HDMI side of it, the GUI feeding the, uh, the control of the Pluto. That's sort of what it looks like. So it's but you call, set up your call sign, frequency, um, your data rate, 333 kilos and moves it's set to. Uh, the various forms of modulation. The most common one is QPSK. That's uh, quadrature modulation. That's a single carrier, but the, you can modulate one of four phases. And what that does, it gives you two bits um, per, per modulating cycle. And how much power are you going to need to get into the satellite? This um, depends on the data rate. So I've got levels here for 250 kilocenter transmission. So it's not too bad, you know, like I've got a 1.2 meter dish, which isn't too huge, just in 30 watts. And it scales with uh, the symbol rate, so 333, which is the popular one, you need about 1.3 times that to have. Right, um, reality now, this is, this is my garden. Um, you can see on the left hand side, cables going down there to the dish. So I've got mains going down there, because I've got mains pacifiers down there. I've got the ethernet cable. Um, 
and that's it really. I've got a, it works perfectly well, the smaller dish on the right, one reads a dish, and that works quite well, but the, the 1.8 meter dish there, quite as recently, um, just means I can get away with running less power. I don't have to sort of slash the uh, PA quite so hard. And it also gives you marginal improvement on the received signal. So if the signal's a bit on the, on the weak side, it gives you a little bit of extra margin there for receiving the stuff. So behind the dish, got a weatherproof box, and that's what's inside it. And it's pretty cheap. The meanwhile, um, it's normally designed for LEDs, uh, 20, 27 volt power supply, which you need to tweak up to 32 volts for the PA. And then in the diecast box in the middle there is, is the Pluto. And I've got a pre amplifier in there to boost the, the uh, wattage up slightly. And there's a, a USB adapter. What, what it's got, it's got a USB interface, um, but you can provide a, a cheap uh, US, USB to Ethernet adapter. So we're talking through the Ethernet to the Pluto. And <coughs> The um, amplifier is, uh, there's various things you can get off eBay, various ex-commercial amplifier blocks. And uh, I achieved, I bought one, G7NTG actually made one, which I bought off him. So that's down the bottom, the big heat sink and a big fan. And then on the dish, this is what we have. So the, down the bottom with the, with the red cap on it, this is just an LMB. Um, <laughs> this is actually um, called a bullseye. This is actually specially developed for QO100 use. So it's actually got, uh, as well as having a low noise figure, the low gloss later is um, quite stable, didn't drift nearly as much. That's uh, standard LMBs. But also, there's the transmit side, we've got a helix. 2.4 gigahertz um, helix just above it and um, <clears throat> I find that works quite well. It's slightly offset because the NMB is at the optimum focal position so the helix is slightly offset but then a comparison there. It's only about 1 dB down which you can easily make up so it's sort of quite effective. Also I can run sort of full power even though it's so close it doesn't actually affect the receive signal. I can run full duplex I can be receiving and while transmitting. Then we have uh, some Peter's, this what is, Peter uses. This is my um, setup. Um, I have a slightly different situation to Nigel. Nigel needs to have his dish right at the bottom of the garden because his house is south facing and the satellite is to the south. So to be far enough back to see over the roof, he's got to have a remote dish um, if you see what I mean, like, like he's just demonstrated to you. I'm quite fortunate, I also have a south facing house, but it's a bungalow, so it's got quite a low roof angle. So I can get away with putting the dish on a pole and having it firing over the roof. And the advantage of that is that I can keep the PA in the shack and run a cable out. Um, I use a five metre low loss cable, which has a loss of about 0.9 of a dB at 2.4 gigahertz, which is quite, um, you know, capable with. And it means that um, the only thing outside is really the dish. And I think that's the next picture, isn't it? That's the transmitter, by the way. The, the black item underneath is the exciter, and the thing above it is the, is the PA. And there's the dish. It's a, it's a prime focus, 1.2 meter, with a helix. You can't quite see a helix there, but it's a bit sticking out. And basically, the cable just literally goes through a hole in the wall into the shack. Now, you don't need to have remote control. So, that's, that's it. Right. Now, for receiving, um, BRTC have come up with a marvellous uh, scheme. They've got a receiver uh, down at Goon Hilly, appropriate location for satellite reception. Um, and they've got this web site which you can uh, just log into. And what it provides you with is a spectrum of what's on. This is a snapshot of a, of a particular evening um, with the uh, 
various signals. And it's quite busy evening, as you can see there. On the left-hand side, the, the big wide thing there is the is the be beacon. And they're doing a uh, they transmit a, a rolling video. <coughs> hopefully, it's showing uh, yeah, showing you that. This is still, as you can see, it just repeats over and again. It's it's a nice. Uh, reliable signal that you can use to uh, tune up your uh, your receiver and your satellite etc. You're receiving that picture and that was your from that, your dish outside. That's right, yeah. So that's that's basically that, dollar. That's yes. it, yeah. 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 This is the uh, using the wide receiver. So we've just got the just got the MIDI tuner there and the and the large reply that, that's all it is. So a quite simple setup. Um, and then also there's a the chat channel here, so you can log in and uh, give a comment. And if you not obeying the rules, uh, they'll probably come up and say, "Boy, if, you know, if you're using the, the wrong bandwidth on the wrong frequency or something, they will, or too much, too much signal or something, they will uh, they will jump on you." So it's uh, the BATC have done a marvelous job actually um, getting all that sort of together. It looks really well. Uh, that's a website just down below there. Um, something that I haven't covered up, but I, I need to mention because it's uh, it's quite popular. It's a totally different solution to what I've described for now. This is a called BATC porch down DATV system, and it's a one box solution. Use basically a beautiful Raspberry Pi with a touch screen, um, and it's basically a trans amateur TV transceiver. You can use both a terrestrial and for QO100. Um, so you can see a touch screen interface. It's got, it's got lots of pages on the touch screen interface. It's a shame one, one of them. Um, and it's uh, still being developed by David Common, chairman of the BATC. He's still actively developing and adding more and more features to it. Um, so I couldn't not mention that. <laughs> and uh, now it's Time for some live demonstration, hopefully. You've seen them. Um, what, you, what you can see on here is the output of the uh, mini tuner. There's um, that's, yeah, that's the net actually, isn't it? Yeah. Hang on a second, I'm just going to try so, that one. So, on a Tuesday. Tuesday evenings, um, they used to have a net on GB3HP, which is the, uh, the repeater farm. But they, they lost this, the uh, repeater site, so um, for the moment they've um, they just wired to um, nothing on the satellite. But typically, the, nothing on at the moment. Yeah, um, but the beacon, I'm going to the beacon on here, so you'll see the same thing that you see there. That's on the minute. All these dials and indicators tell you things about the signal. Yeah, that's showing you that this is QPSK, so you can see the, the, the four phases of signal. Can you just select the picture in a second? Yeah. That's the four. This is, um, someone's done some software which accesses that BATC website I, I showed you, um, and it gives you a display which allows you to, you can actually click. Very network connection. <laughs> <laughs> we must be struggling with the uh, so. Um, yeah. So what you can do is you can see a signal here. Rather than fiddle around and say, "Oh, what's the frequency? What's the signal rate in that?" If you click on that, and it automatically sends the, what's needed to set up the MIDI tuner. So it's a convenient way of uh, working. Uh, we've temporarily lost uh, network connection. Yeah, we're sort of we're just using a, a Vodafone Wi-Fi router here with a mobile connection, so it might be a, uh, that's a bit uh, a bit flaky, maybe. It's a shame. Ah, hang on. It, it's getting the uh, beacon here. Yeah. As Nigel said, the idea of the beacon is it's a rolling transmission which you can use for checking your receiver. 
So it's always there, it's on there 24 7. So if you're setting up, it's ideal because you can find it and check that your system's working. And using these signal displays at the bottom, you can check the how good your system is and how well you're receiving it and whether the dish is optimised and all that kind of stuff. So it's quite useful. Shall we do transmission now? Yeah. Um, we can't, unfortunately, we can't transmit to the satellite live tonight. We do bring the all the gear that's needed there, with the PA and all the rest of it. But uh, what we can do is um, show you, hopefully, uh, transmission lo picking up locally. So what you can do is, the transmit frequency is, you know, as I said, around about 2.4 gigs. And what we do is we tune into that 2.4 gigs. So it's pretty close to receiving the satellite, uh, just so you haven't got that frequency change in the way. So let's, let's try and see whether that works. With yeah, so if we go to what frequency are you on? Two four oh nine uh two five two four two four. Oh two four. So if I pick up on this as well. Oh two four. Nine. Oh nine two five. Oh two four oh let me just uh, oh, two, five. It's three 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 presumably. Yeah. Oh, hang on, it's got the offset. Oh, so, this is, sorry. so this is um, the menu of the right receiver. So I can, if I go on to the presets, I've got various presets here. So if I tune down to 2409.25, that should be transmitting on, on that. Okay, let's see. O two four nine two five double O. Is that right? Two four oh nine two five. Two four oh. Oh, hang on. That's where we've gone wrong. O two four oh nine two five. Yeah. I may have to switch to the other input on the mini tube to um, receive it. So that's so it's receiving the Pluto. Which I just showed you on the slide. It's, there's Pluto to plug into the USB interface on the laptop. That's got a little area there. A bit of USB. Not a, it seems to be going up and down like a yo-yo. I don't know. Why. I'm just going to try this switch to switch to input B. We can see it's fairly high resolution. Even for normal amateur, amateur TV use, it's uh, even though it's quite heavily compressed, it's quite ideal because it's normally it's like a talking head, so it's not that much movement. So you can get away with this is running at 3CC killer symbols per second. These old um, test cards, are they not copyrighted then? You can use them if you want to, can you? Oh, I'm sure they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look into it. Okay. <laughs> we see the young ladies now in their 80s. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've got the same jewelry I've seen, but it hasn't actually locked up for some reason. It's again, alternatively, D3 and D14, so <laughs> there's a lot of QSB, as you can Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? Seems to be trying. It's also got that um, slightly spurious um, constellations diagonal. Well, perhaps it's set to. Um, there you go. Ah, you got it. Got it. Um, oh, I have to get out of the way. Yeah. I, th I think it's that's literally what it is. I think it's, it's position in the, in the room that you must set the. Um, it's very un unscientific to me. What you can do at home is you can transmit and then receive and see a signal coming back from the satellite. So you actually see up and up and down at the same time. And there's there's 
there's about a five second transmission delay. It's not to do with the propagation time, but it's to do with the digital processing time. So I think you saw earlier somebody was receiving their own signal and, and repeating it. And you could see it was like a whole of mirrors with, with the picture and then another picture and then another picture after that and so on. There's about a five second cycle in between as, as it goes. I don't know why. Um, there's plenty of signal, I don't know why it's not receiving it here, but anyway. Oh, there, there we go. It's the wrong aspect ratio, never mind. Okay. It's more reliable normally through the satellite. It is actually, it's very reliable through the satellite. <laughs> You're getting D10 now, and it's D, D12, and it's still not. <coughs> you weren't on the, the um, uh, Intel. No, you? I checked that. No, it's not soft. Anyway, you get the idea. Anyway, you hopefully get the idea. <laughs> this is this is very much a bodge to try and simulate a transmit system. Maybe moving this around. I remember Tony Hancock's sketch from many years ago, or something like this. <laughs> Hang on, what have we got there? No? No, oh, I think you've I think disconnected I've... something, because yeah. it's... Um... Yeah. What I can do is if I restart this, it will, it will go back to the default, which is... Um, it'll go back to the... If you can close it for a moment. Cancel. What I'm going to do is go back to restart it and it should come back to the um, uh, thingy again, the uh, beacon again. So it defaults to the beacon when it starts up, so hopefully that should turn. Um, so right, it's already coming up. It didn't wait long enough. This laptop isn't the fastest. I don't quite know what struggle with this one. Anyway. Here and it's defaulted back to the uh, back to the beacon again. You can select on the screen here. You you can get rid of all these these measurement devices around the side. So the um, the um, pie chart you can see shows the constitution of the signal, how what bits of different bits are being used for, um, and that can be quite useful. You can magnify that, or you can make it full screen so it actually. Um, uh, yeah, it appears, it appears hopefully like that. For some reason, this, <laughs> this is, there it is, there it is. He's back. So there you go. That, that's that's working basically through um, through the mini tuner setup. For some reason, it seems a little bit uh, flaky tonight. I don't know why. But then we can go back to right. Let's just see if there's anything anything else, anyone else has come up since we've been. Doing things. It varies tremendously. Sometimes it's dead quiet, other times it's the It's actually full. full. It's full. It's just <laughs> yeah, it's a live tune. It's not just a this that, there's, 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 there's something right at the end there. That's, that might, that's a channel that's often used for the BATC. So if we bring that up. Oh, 
That's G4KLB. Yeah. 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 You got any sound on that? G4KLB, private satellite. You saw early, earlier PA3, I can't remember the rest of the call sign, but you see people from literally all over um, the world on here. There's a couple of guys from South Africa that regularly have the QSL on here. Um, that's true, because that's GGZ. Oh, he's actually. Um, oh, he's, he's demonstrating the, yeah. the same thing that we've got here. <laughs> They're all cheating going in on the streaming. I'm attempting to do a bit of RF here via the satellite. Oh, it is to Mike. There we are. Oh, Mike's doing it, but the right way. But your audio is weak because this is relying on the microphone, I think. Yes. But, uh, these are actual live amateur pictures. And they're receivable from anywhere within that, that footprint that you saw on the map. So literally, you know, down to the South Pole and uh, um, across to Brazil and across to India and up north as well. Um, it's and the, I take it the, the, the different picture quality between what we're seeing now and what we've seen years ago is purely down to um, the, the, the amount of bandwidth or the amount of information you can get on the, yes. That's on right. the available bandwidth. Yeah, yeah, because we're using compression, because uh, yeah. we're using digital techniques, yeah. digital compression. It starts off with um, a little JPEG where you can. Uh, press still images down to quite a small um, size. This, this is taking it one step further, but using the JPEG algorithm, it's, it's got MPEG, which means it's also looking at movement. And if it, if it doesn't see much movement, then it says, well, I don't need to transmit that information. I'll use what I had last time, because there's no point in transmitting it again. And then every now and again, it will send a keyframe, which is where it does send a whole lot in case it gets a, a bit too far out of step. So you're basically using the same principles as the commercial? Yes. Yeah. This is a tweaked version of what broadcasters use, but it's reduced bandwidth, um, which it wouldn't be um, suitable for a broadcast use, probably because the picture, the move, the picture movement, <coughs> you try to put a football map on this, you know, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be great. Mm. But the other thing is we also are now using um, uh, H.265 coding rather than 264, which is much more efficient, so you can get much better motion handling, even on a reduced bandwidth than before. So it, it starts to get close to what to some broadcast stations in quality. In HD, you can you know you, you can run HD on this either 720p or or, or you know 1920 by 1080. Some people run. Um, run either, and also almost uh, there are all sorts of other standards you can run as well, which you can select. It's all part of the transmission system yes, that Nigel told you about earlier. Because you can use this is QPSK, um, which is quad phase shifting, but you can do 8PSK, those eight phases, or 16APSK, which actually has got sort of two amplitude levels as, as well as eight um, phases, and you can even to do 32 APSK, so you've got a lot of dots in the constellation. And the, um, because you've got a, a transponder, what you send out, you get back. Yeah. Basically, then, uh, you, if you processed it properly and modulated it, you can send out voice and get voice back if anybody's listening or to see wholly yeah. used stuff for No, it's got um, No, it's got um, the, it, the transponder split into. Um, just for the beam, it's split into an 8 meg, meg um, bandwidth, and a, there's a half meg allocation as well, which is used for the narrow band stuff. So you can use it, you put SSB, CW. Um, right, okay, I can't just count any longer. In theory, you could do FM, but they, they don't, 
but I don't like the use in there because that's the sonic oh, power, uh, you know, it's uh, using a lot of power. Uh, I don't know if they're going to, not coming to me yet. Um, we've actually got an Just SDR here, here, and one of the things we were going to do, having done the later part of the demo, was to show you, is to show you, hopefully, how it's going to be as well. As nothing seems to be happening. Good job. It's like remote helps. But yes, so so but as you gather, their sound is 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 goes with the pictures as well. So you've got you you've got um, you know proper television with, with sound. Yeah, so yeah, so in this case the sound is part of the data stream. Yeah. Um, but as I say the narrow band section then you know just pure audio SSB or whatever. And people do slow scan and all sorts of uh, they have all sorts of Running, uh, it has all thing. the same coverage as the uh, video transponder does. In fact, that might be worth, worth connecting up. But anyway, it's, it's quite interesting to actually see. Uh, They've gone off. They've gone off. You've got red lights down there, which means there's no signal. When there's a signal, you get three greens and then it, it locks up. So it's it. Well, it looks, I think he's gone off. So it, it holds the last, the last image. I'll just have a look to see if anyone else is on. Let's bring up the... Uh... So you don't get the... Um... No, there's nobody else on. You don't get the, the default signal on the other point too, but please check your antenna. <laughs> <laughs> you do on this one, don't you? <laughs> so, I mean, if we go, if we go back to the... Um... Back to the beacon again, which is always a good, good starting point. Um, there's always something there you can try, so it's, you know. Right, so we're going to go back to the beacon again. Because this is a bit bigger, it's all affected by high pressure, like um, free to air. No, sometimes you see a small variation in signals, but um, nothing, nothing major. If it's really black sky and horrible rain, you know, like you get in England, um, uh, then um, you, you can find that the um, uh, signal gets a bit weaker um, be because, because it's the attenuation. But it's mostly the attenuation, it's probably at uh, the receive side, which is at the receive side is 10 gigs. 2.4 going up is probably a bit more rugged than, than 10 coming back. So there you are, that's, that's back to the... Uh, Hang on a second, I'll just go back. Sorry, I didn't maximise that again. There you are. So, anyway, there you go. Um, that's. Uh, <laughs> that's all received and can be received on a, on a moderate sized dish. That dish out there is a 0.9 metre um, elliptical dish. And it was designed for use with an internet um, satellite internet system called Connect, um, which is part of Utilsat, I think. Um, but um, I uh, removed the bit that was on the front and put, and put the, the um, bullseye LNB on there that Nigel mentioned, and made a bracket to mount it because it didn't have an LNB originally. And it works quite happily as a as a as a received. I use it as a received dish at home. The bigger dish I use for transmit. I've got an LNB on the big dish as well, but unfortunately I get some interference when transmitting. Um, so at the moment I've got a second um, dish. I'm going to try Nigel's scheme of having two separate antennas um, separated in space. At the moment what I've got is the, my, the original dish LNB is firing through the middle of the helical. So you've got the helical and then the um, LNB is looking through the middle which gives you slight attenuation of the signal. And it does work, but it actually, um, when you're transmitting it, it tends to clobber the, um, the receiver. And that may well be down to my LMB rather than anything else. Maybe a different LMB would work better. But anyway, should, do you want to actually try the, um, the narrow band? Yeah. Shall we try that? <coughs> we haven't connected that up yet, which I thought we'd get working first. And that would be something that we'd about um, LMBs is uh, I mentioned that you can just use a standard LMB that you use for like broadcast satellite. Um, the trouble with it, that is they, they drift a bit. So if you set it up with your uh, SGR like we're doing here, 
um, you're tuned in, but then you find you have to keep retuning. It's, it's drifting All right, quite badly. Now, the um, piece of software that um, we use is, uh, and it's various pieces of software you can use with SDRs, but we use a, well, something called SDR Console, and that's actually got a, a clever technique where it actually, it's actually monitoring one of the uh, narrow band beacons on the satellite, and actually using that as a frequency reference. It actually tracks the tuning, so that's the commentator with that drift, which is pretty amazing. Have you got um, your splitter, the, the other splitter? Is that connected or not? Um, the other splitter. It's all right, I'll, I'll have to disconnect something. To... I'll disconnect the right. I've got one, I've got one in, the, uh, in the car. No, don't worry. Do you want a 10 minute break while you set this up but they can have tea? Well, that sounds like it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Can you come through? Break for 10 minutes? Yeah, that sounds great. Right. Sure. Then we can modulate and we can. Yeah, yeah, the LMB, it's just using standard LMB. Yeah. Receiving 10 gigahertz and frequency shifting it down to 740. All oh, right. So I see. Perfect. Thank you. Very much. And the opposite way to transmit is via this device. That's and right. You connect the output of the SMA to the helix antenna that you need. Yeah. Yeah. That's the narrow band transponder. Yeah. Also a big live with a large six. Yes, 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 yes,